thank you for the invitation and thanks for the privilege to to present to the NSTF. I, I know it's a, a greatly admired organization and a privilege to be associated with you. In terms of um, of what I'm just going to present, uh, Yancy, is, is two years ago, um, in, in I think it was October 2021, I also presented it, and, and I decided to use a lot of the same slides. It's two years down the line, and I just wanted to see where we are. Um, uh, the previous time I was specifically discussing load setting, and um, I think what, what I want to discuss today is a little bit related, and that's how, we, how do we do this transition in, in a highly politicized environment. Right. So <laughs> what is happening to, to our electricity availability factor? And um, it was in my previous presentation as well. And, and since then, it has actually gone down quite a bit. And you can then see in this slide from 2021, what is the electricity availability factor uh, doing in terms of, uh, in terms of the week, weeks of the, the year. And it's normally higher in the winter because um, uh, the planned maintenance is mainly scheduled for, uh, for the summer. And, and what you can see is in 2023, it's been significant lower than in 2022 and 2021. Although we, we understand that there is some uh, comfort in, 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 in getting some stability from, from some of the ESCOM plant, especially in, in Pumalanga in the last few weeks. So it's old thumbs that that continues. But um, if, if you believe in statistics and you believe in, in, in uh, regression and, 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 and those type of mathematics, um, it will be hard for us to turn around the availability factor and actually increase it as we uh, we would like to see in the country. Um, quite an old slide, but I still think this is, is, is very uh, relevant. We've got an aging generation fleet in ESCOM. We see there, for instance, the second one on the left is uh, Kumati. It was 55 years old uh, by the time the slide was uh, uh, made. Since then, in end of 2022, Kumati has been decommissioned. And what's interesting about this whole decommissioning is in the last few weeks, you would have uh, heard both the Minister of uh, Mineral Resources and Energy, as well as the new Minister of Electricity, um, having a lot to say about um, why Kumati would, was decommissioned while it was in perfect operational condition, um, why was 1,000 megawatts taken off the, of the national grid, the amount of jobs that was lost there and everything else that goes with it. However, if you look at the reality, is only 120 megawatt was available from this power station and operational by uh, the time it was decommissioned. Extremely old power station. I can tell you I'm also 55 and I won't be operating at my optimal. Um, and therefore, I understand the power station uh, would, would, would not be able to do that either. Um, so th there's a narrative being created um, by the incumbents in the coal industry and everybody around that, uh, that this transition is actually negative and that we need to stick to fossil fuels and the old coal-fired power stations. And I just need to, to highlight that as that narrative is, is wrong and does a, is not helpful in terms of the transition that we're trying to drive in the country. Again, let's look at technology disruption and, and you get to a point where um, if you've got a certain amount of market size, around 75% of, of, um, of the market is, is then supplied by a certain type of technology, you get to this inflection point and, and you really start to, to see disruption from a technology perspective. And I think quite a few of the previous speakers have I've, I've, I've mentioned this and, and, and averted to, to this type of um, uh, disruption. And you, you will see that in solar, you will see that in wind, you will see that in battery, and also busy happening in the hydrogen electrolysis, electrolysis uh, technologies as well. So um, massive falling uh, costs. And, and what does that lead to? It leads to 
this causal feedback loop. So you've got new technology, lower costs, more demand, more product investment, more supply, and then you get more infrastructure investment, more government support. You get stronger networks, more public acceptance, better capability, and then less demand. And that's what's happening to the old coal fire power station, coal, uh, coal technology. I've come out of the coal environment myself. My uh, uh, worked for uh, for Iscor and Kumba. Zaro was responsible for business development in coal, and you can see that uh, this is falling um, over time. The demand for for that technologies. Um, you also have then the older technology at the same time where you get less revenue. Uh, less supply, higher costs, less revenue, less profit, less product production investment, less infrastructure investment, and less government support. And then you get weaker network effects and less public acceptance. And these two feedback loops work together. And, and that's why you see this lowering of cost in solar, wind, hydrogen uh, batteries. And you see this increasing in cost in old fossil fuel technology. Uh, pricing. And I mean, we know that we've seen that over and over again, this whole thing of, of when the, the, the motor car was invented and the horse and cart became, uh, that became a challenging industry. And what's interesting about that is there was no just transition designed for, for the horse and cart industry. The same happened in, in, in digital photography, in photography per se, where it went completely digital, film, film went out, there was no just transition for people working in, in the film industry. Um, and then you had, saw the same in the blockbuster video type uh, industry and, and where that has been replaced by, by new technology. So the same has happened and the same is happening at speed and it's increasingly so that this disruption is, ha is happening in the energy industry. Now, let's just look again at, at, at what I've shown before. What, what's actually interesting in South Africa, we've got this schizophrenic government, amazing work being done by the same government, and you can see that in the Department of Science Technology, DTIC, uh, many other places, but then you also have challenges in, in government around the, the policy the regulatory environment for, for the energy transition. And, and as previously, all of these things happen. I'm not going to talk through it again. But we see more government support for, for the old technology and less government support for the new technology. Um, that, that creates an, a halt. You, you halt the network effects. Um, you su halt supply. Um, but what's interesting about it is um, you get less infrastructure investment, but more private sector support. So we've got a massive challenge in this country. And what you can see, for instance, just to prove that, is that I'm working in the renewable energy industry on a daily basis. Um, the private sector goes out on an RFPs, request for proposals to, to buy renewable electricity from private, uh, uh, private uh, IPPs. Um, but I haven't seen one RFP in the whole market coming out to actually request somebody to supply them with industry from, from electricity from a coal, new coal plant. So, so although there is this more private sector support, there's less government support um, from some of our government departments and actually the part, departments that's responsible to drive this transition. So, what are what are the typical obstacles to resolve load shedding and then in in terms of this transition to uh, to the new economy in, in energy is um is the whole revolution around rooftop solar and 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 uh, mr moyo uh, uh, discussed that and and how each each building each each house each household in south africa could become its own small power station um so any ideas? I could sell my excess electricity from a rooftop solar, and I'll show you the numbers now on how much there is to a specific grid connected user. You can't. In Cape Town now, you can. Two years ago, when I talked to you, the specific slide, you couldn't. In the meantime, Cape Town went and they said, listen, we'll pay you cash for your energy. And suddenly there's a revolution in Cape Town 
around this. So it's all about removing that obstacles that I, I talked about in the previous slide. So this, this uh, table comes from ESCO. Um, quite interesting. And you can see in March 2022, where were we in rooftop solar installation in South Africa? 983 megawatts. And then you can see how it increases. And we, in June of this year, we sat at 4,400 megawatts, 4.4 gigawatts rooftop solar. Just to give you an idea how much that is, in, in the, uh, the Renewable Energy IPP program, the REAP as we know it, excellent, well-designed program that started in November 2011, there's around six gigawatts of installed capacity after, after 12 years. Yeah, we, we can see the increase from, it's just a little bit more than a year or four gigawatts of installed capacity. And a lot of this goes with battery storage technology as well. And that's why we also see uh, uh, less load shedding. I mean, there's many reasons. I'm sorry about that. Uh, just want to resume. Okay, sorry about that. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Um, just need to put this thing on flight mode. Sorry, then, then we won't have the problem again. Um, so, so you can see, despite the challenges that we that we have um, with different messages from different departments and in government, uh, all the good work on the one hand and all the obstacles on the other hand, the private sector has actually just released and, and unleashed this, this, this transition, this unplanned transition now, um, which really assists uh, the challenges that we've got around energy. So in terms of applying our minds uh, around um, around the solutions is um, a, a massive build out of, of renewables is needed and is going to happen whether it is allowed or not by certain uh, people within government. Um, we need uh, between 120 and 200 gigawatts of solar and wind. We need uh, up to 90 hours of, of battery storage and what we've seen in the last few months is, is, is a rollout of of storage around quite a few substations that ESCOM uh, has put out on, a, on an RFP and is being built as we speak. Um, we had the IRP 2019, and I, I think the IRP 2023 was published in the last few days. Haven't studied it yet, but I think it is a step back towards fossil fuels. Um, massive focus on investment in grid infrastructure needs to be prioritized. The government needs to show commitment to push through with the unbundling of ESCOM. It's busy happening, although we've got all these challenges that the, the ERA wasn't tabled at, 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 in Parliament at the time it should have. It's now been tabled. Uh, we just see, uh, again, obstacles being rolled into the way there. Um, what's interesting is you've got this dualism in, in government where where in the DMRE, there's a, this pushback against the, this transition, but in the presidency, it's actually managed quite well with the with the Presidential Climate Commission, Operation Vulland Lela uh, on that side. And, and as you know, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy a few years ago mentioned that the president twisted his arm, um, changed the, 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 the license cap from one megawatt to 10 megawatt, then to 100 megawatt, then it was removed. And since that day until now, there's nine gigawatts of private generation uh, being being finalized and being built and being licensed and permitted throughout the country. So just removing one small obstacle in a way unleashed this investment in, in, in massive amounts of energy generation capacity. Yes. In the meantime, the energy electricity one-stop shop was uh, was uh, uh, launched in the last few weeks by the DTIC, and and we've got high hopes for that uh, really playing a massive role in the transition. 
Um, NERSA should optimize its processes for registration and licensing and everything else around that. And NERSA needs to start acting as a, as a regulator in terms of municipalities that doesn't comply to the rules of the game. Um, we, we, we should also look at uh, municipalities allowing excess energy from this uh, commercial and industrial type installations, rooftop installations to be fed back into the grid. We can see that starting to happen now. And then the private sector should be enticed to build grid and to assist municipalities in 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 this transition. There's uh, is massive opportunities in this. We're extremely positive that it will have a positive impact, that it will democratize energy in the country, and it will enable uh, many more people to to be employed meaningfully uh, in this system. Hmm. I think that's my that's my. Uh, uh, presentation, Jan. Yeah, I know it was it was very similar to two years ago, but there's lots of new information in it and lots of progress made, which is is extremely positive. Thank you very much, uh, Tommy Garner. Um, that was very interesting indeed to contrast it with two years ago. I mean, um, there were lots of complaints at the time that government was holding back and not allowing independent power producers to come on and participate. And uh, like you say, the, this um, is a huge change that has in fact been unleashed. Right, questions? We have a few minutes for questions, so please uh, go ahead. Um, Katlehu says, why is there a need for transition through IPPs only and not a combination of ESCOM and IPPs producing renewable energy? Why only private sector ownership instead of government ownership? Would you like to respond to that? No, I think, I mean, this. I think... There could be a transition through government ownership and private ownership, and I think the original ESCOM model, when it was formed in 1923 by by Hendrik van der Beil, was to have a non-profit company, a true sense non-profit company, that would supply the cheapest electricity to uh, to industry and to then industrialize South Africa from there. Um, and and that actually happened. So so I'm all for government ownership, government intervention, if the purpose is to have the cheapest electricity. However, in the last few years, um, that has changed completely, that uh, ESCOM became uh, the milking cow and the gravy train um, and was uh, used to enrich the few uh, at the cost of, of the many and of the people. So I think the transition is driven by economics and simply by the fact that at this stage, the private industry can supply electricity cheaper than ESCOM can because it doesn't have the baggage of mm -hmm. state capture and theft and corruption that goes with it. Right. Yes. Yes. Any other questions? This is from Nkize. Um, Thank you very much for the interesting presentations. It is encouraging to see that government is preparing um, the youth to play a role in the challenging power issue. Um, Mr. Kuna's presentation gives hope regarding the solar energy, indeed. Pindulu says, um, is energy storage a reliable source of continuous energy supply for the entire Republic? I think, Yancy, just to answer that one, I think um, energy storage could play and is playing and will, will increasingly play a massive role in continuous energy supply. However, it's not the only solution. The solution lies in the combination of different um, types of technologies. So we will still, for for a good 40 to 50 years, have coal 
in the mix, in the energy mix, and rightly so. Uh, we should have, we would have an increase in in gas to power. We probably would have an increase in hydro pump storage, um, and then we would have, like I said, a, a quite an overbuild or massive overbuild in solar and wind, and then related storage, battery storage, and that that battery storage um, really would play a, a massive role in continuous supply if designed right and if positioned right at the right places and i can just say it's not it's not only giving storage it's also increasing what we call the customer load network in a specific area so just to give you an idea the two parts uh, and there's more than that but two parts of uh, that storage does play in this is to say that um, if you've got for instance solar in the eastern cape or solar and wind in the eastern cape but there's not enough grid capacity and you put battery storage at that specific point, then that battery storage point becomes a load and you can actually increase the supply of electricity or, uh, into that load on, on the same site. When the solar is not there at night time, then you can actually evacuate from the battery. So, so you've got the ability to, to increase the load network at the specific point, but also to evacuate when you don't have the resource. And that combination is is absolutely amazing in terms of, of grid stability for the country. Right. Very interesting. I think the technology has improved um, quite fast with regards to, to battery storage, How, hasn't it? Sorry, Yanti, I just missed your question. Um, I think the, the technology of of battery storage has improved significantly over the past few years. Yeah, I think I think technology definitely, but uh, pricing specifically, and that that comes with mass manufacturing and this whole, let's say, positive uh, uh, feedback loops that I spoke about in one of my slides. But there's also also a lot of uh, scientists looking into alternative sources of energy storage and batteries, uh, as opposed to let's say lithium ion phosphate. Um, uh, the specific liquid metal batteries and other batteries that um, is being developed and that could, could have longer duration storage. I'm talking about six, six, eight hours type of storage as opposed to up to four hours where the lithium iron phosphate is really in a, in a, in a sweet spot. So, so that combination, I think the answer is also not in a specific technology of battery, but in combination of technologies for batteries.